St. John's. Hi, my name is Bill Coulters, producer of the television series Arts Delight. This week's guest is Mary Walsh. What makes this retrospective show special is that Mary Walsh is interviewed by her friend of many years, Bob Wakeham. Their friendship shows as Mary quite openly discusses the ups and downs of her dramatic and colorful career. It's well worth watching. I hope you enjoy it. I'm Laura Coltis, your host for Arts Delight. Mary Walsh was with Codco right at its beginning in St. John's. 30 years later, she's still rolling on from that exciting beginning to nowadays creating, writing, and acting with the energy of a teenager. Guest interviewer Bob Wagum will chat with Mary about the many aspects of her varied and still vibrant career. If you stay tuned, you will see two old friends talk about the past with Mary being her usual frank and open self. Here's Bob Wakeham's interview with guest Mary Walsh. I tell you now, I was uh, recently listening to uh, an interview on CBC Radio that you did with Tom Power, a member of the younger generation of Newfoundlanders making good, younger than us anyway. Yeah. And he referred to you uh, during the interview as a Canadian icon. So I'm driving along in my truck and I'm saying, imagine that, Mary Walsh, my friend Mary Walsh, is a Canadian icon. And I said, the next time I see her, I'm going to ask her, how does one become a Canadian icon? Or how do you feel about being referred to as a Canadian icon? So here with this television audience, I'm going to ask you that. Well, you know, right? I think, Bob, you know, that seemed to certainly creep, creep up on me, the fact that people were calling me a Canadian icon as opposed to, like, throwing me out of their house, kind of. And I think it is just longevity. I think people say that all the time. If you last long enough, people go, oh, she's so funny. People who never thought I was funny at all, thought I was saucy, I should be shut down and shut up, you know, suddenly are calling me a Canadian icon. Not that Tom Power is one of those people, but, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, so everybody doesn't call me a Canadian icon, but those who do, I think it's just that I've been around. So I've been doing comedy for 40 years, so after a while... But you, you had know, to do it well, Mary. You're being modest here. Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying I didn't do it well or that I didn't have lots of opportunities, lots of luck and lots of help along the way. I'm not saying anything about that, but the iconic status seems to come with time, right? Inevitably, no matter what you do, if you do it long enough, and it take, it, it, you have to have some talent to do it long enough, don't you? And, and, and some talent to be able to keep at it. Because, uh, you know, people used to, Aunt May used to always say, you should get something you could fall back on. You know, like your, um, uh, what was that called? You know, you had shorthand and typing, uh, your commercial. You should get a, your commercial uh, diploma, so you have something to fall back on. And uh, I noticed along the way that people who had something to fall back on often fell back. Uh, because it is difficult to keep going, and if you had nothing to fall back on, there was nowhere else to go except keep going, keep at it, keep your head down, one foot in front of the other, right? So, are, are you relatively comfortable, though, when you hear that term being used to describe you? Uh, relatively comfortable. You know, what do you mean? Uh, when, when someone on a radio uh, program uh, aired across Canada refers to you as a as an icon. Uh, and do you do you do you twitch at all? Do you just say, oh, it's fine. I just accept it, and that's it. I, I, I'm an icon now. I never even think about it. I mean, I hadn't thought about the, it when you asked me, and I just think that uh, you know, it's still, you know, I can't even get in the CBC building in Toronto. You know what I mean? Without somebody from deep, deep within the corp letting me in. I remember Sheila Rogers saying that she tried to get in and she, there was there used to be a cutout of her up there and Buddy wouldn't let her in and she went I'm Sheila Rogers I'm on the radio. No, couldn't get in. She went over got the the cutout she said look that's me. I never could not get in the building. So being a Canadian icon maybe with 25 cents or five dollars could get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks you know but uh, other than that 
you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to be dismissive of, uh, of other people's praise, because, of course, I'm thrilled, you know. Well, I, I've I always guess, wanted I, well, to Well, let, let me come at it from this point of view, Mary. Uh, the idea of you coming to grips with being uh, a star. Old. Uh, <laughs> an old star. An old star, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was reading an interview recently, actually, in The Herald uh, about you, and this reporter, uh, who wasn't a youngster, but this reporter... In, in the piece said, I was absolutely starstruck when Mary Walsh uh, greeted me at the door of her home here. So she was starstruck. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder how Mary feels about that. I mean, she, you must be aware of the fact that you you you, you go into a, a, an airport or you go into a grocery store and people say, there's Mary Walsh, there, there, there's Mary Walsh, you know? I know. So how, do you ever stop and think, well, how, did this all be, how did this all happen? take place happen? Well, I, just, just to, by way of, you know, I just met Jane Fonda at the 10, um, you know, 10 minutes, 10, top 10 or something. I spoke and I did a thing about Harvey Weinstein and stuff like that. I did some comedy. And she spoke at the end about the environment. And when I came backstage after, she said, oh, there's Mary. And she came over and she put, put her arms around me and she said, uh, you know, the woman who was with her was the president, the new president of Greenpeace, whose mother, and I went green, and Jane introduced me to her, and I went, oh, we're not that, you know, happy about Greenpeace, should I know, but my mother's from Burgio, and she said, and I know we have a lot of apologies to make, and she said they've already apologized to the Inuit in, you know, anyway, I found that really, like the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I thought, oh my God, things are changing. Anyway, but Jane Fonda then said, oh, you're from the same place as Donald Sutherland. Then I said, no, I was, you know, it was different, blah, blah, blah. So then we gossiped about our friend, you know, Donald Sutherland and Shirley Douglas. And then I forgot to say to her, oh my God, because she had said in her talk how she'd had three acts in her life. And I forgot to say to her how meaningful each of her acts had been and how extraordinary she was and how, because I just talked to her just like a person because she is just a person and that's the way she acts. And I thought, that is the way, that has been my experience it, through my life anyway, that people who really are there, like she sort of has been a star since birth, I guess, um, are no different than other people, except I guess they have better clothes and they, you know what I mean? All that stuff. They have all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But, you but never... she doesn't. She didn't treat anybody like that stuff, yeah. you know. And, and you never have either, Mary. Not from what I know, yeah. anyway. So uh, you've had no difficulty then, obviously, staying uh, grounded. It's not hard to stay grounded at home, is it? I was going. When, I remember once coming because people say everything to you, don't they? I remember coming home from Halifax. Uh, when the summer I had to get all the groceries because everything was gone so I had a big cart of food and I was coming towards a guy was coming towards me he looked at the food looked at me he looked at the food again looked at me he said eat much I was like you know <laughs> sir just think about thinking before you speak <laughs> but you know um, people just say you know because we seem to have a bit of Tourette's as well as, you know, all the other stuff we have but you know we say everything so it's not hard to and I live here and we were the, you know, the, 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 uh, what, what do you call it? The something rug of, of uh, I forget it was an old Codco line. Uh, the, um, the something. Mess. I wish I could help you here, man. I know <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the. Oh God damn it! I can't remember it. And the laughing stock of Canada for so long, and so we lived in such deep shame on some level, no matter how cocky we were, uh, because we felt that everybody felt that we were no good, and everybody laughed at us and. You know, every thought we had, I remember Rick Mercer saying that as far as he was concerned and as far as most Newfoundlanders were concerned, they could leave that nickel in the ground in, uh, you know, down in Labrador uh, uh, forever, you know, that they, they would rather do that than sign another uh, or agreement. And people laughed. They thought it was... And he kept trying to say, no, no, I'm serious. We do feel that way, you know? And it's like, oh, that's such a ludicrous notion that you would leave something in the ground rather than, uh, you know, uh, uh, rather than uh, destroy the environment and make yourself, you know, feel bad for 900. How many years has it been since we signed that uh, Churchill Falls deal? 69, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah, yeah. So we're still, there's so many things that we carry around. So it's really hard. And as Andy Jones once said, people say it's an old Newfoundland saying, but it's not. It's Andy from Faustus Bidgood. When they rise up, they get confused. So whenever I start to rise up a bit, I get completely confused and, and you know, brought back down to earth fairly quickly. We'll be right back after these very important messages. Hi, my name is Bill Coltus, author of the book 
revenge finds a home. The story opens up with a bird watcher walking through the woods and he comes across a body that has an arrow through its neck. Then enters Inspector Bob Lynch. It's a very complicated investigation which goes from Newfoundland, British Columbia, Dakota and down to Brazil. It's an intricate story and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. If you want a copy, you can go to Amazon, Indigo Chapters, Flanker Press, or any fine bookstore in your area. Early cockle was a local phenomenon, which slowly caught the eyes and ears of a national Canadian audience. Did Mary ever think they would catch on nationally? Mary, when you were starting off, you and Andy and uh, and, and Graham, Greg and, and Damia, yeah. uh, back in the 70s, <clears throat> do you remember, was there ever a point when you thought to yourself, God, we're, we're on to something, you know? I, I think this is starting to work when you hear people like me and many others busting the gut out in the audience, especially with your Catholic jokes, you know? But was there ever a point when you said, I think we're on to something, or was it just you're, you're going with the flow and you'd write a play and perform a play and then, and then get on to the next play? Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I was, you know, really innocent uh, comedy-wise and performance-wise when I met Andy and Greg, who had been, you know, that and Tommy, say, for instance. Tommy had wanted to be a dancer and a singer and a performer from birth, kind of, and, and the other two were that way, too. And... Uh, but I had wanted to be a journalist, really, and I didn't really give up on journalism until I was 27. That's why This Hour's 22 Minutes was so great, because I got to play a journalist on TV. But um, so I just went along with the Codco thing, because I was living with them, and I was really, you know, not that great at it. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I was, I didn't know, I, I, I felt, had no faith in what we were doing when, when we were doing it in Toronto, and then we, brought it home, and somehow or other, there's some part of me that's better than my mind, I suppose, because I went ahead, I quit theater school and, and came home to do the tour and stuff, and, uh, and Andy really helped me, because, like, I was so ashamed <laughs> that I mostly did my lines to the side of the stage. Like, I, well, that was when I started. And then Ray Guy gave us this fantastic review and called us the, the children of, um, of, of uh, Johnny Burke. And uh, that was when we did a show in the in the basement of the Little Theater. That was just when we came home. And he mentioned me. I, I didn't know Ray Guy then, but I was always such a huge fan. Because when you were in grade nine, you would be reading the telegram for the Ray Guy thing. Like, you come home from school and read the paper. Like, I know that in the old days people did that, but nobody in grade nine ever did that, except to read Ray Guy. Um, but so he, that meant a lot to me. And... Uh, I didn't really believe in it and uh, then, but I remember being in the bathroom at Peter Narvaez's at a party, and people were outside, and this must have been for, by our second show, Sickness, Death, and Beyond the Grave, and people were talking about Codco, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm part of that. Like, and I remember thinking, you know, feeling good that I was part of something all, you know, be it not in any kind of... Uh, conscious way that that people liked you know that people liked and uh, we thought like a, a crowd from quebec came down and interviewed me and they went why did you guys end up on national tv a, a, you know nobody's from nowheresville basically and i went wow we never thought like that at all we thought about goddamn time and we should be on more and why are kids in the hall getting so much goddamn attention and why aren't they signing us on for so we had the totally no self-respect and the or weaning ambition and and self-aggrandizement but you know what i mean because we thought uh, that we uh, i don't know we thought we had something to say well maybe you know, there, you know sometimes some people used to refer that to that back then mary as newfoundland chauvinism and i used to say whenever i'd hear it well better newfoundland chauvinism than Newfoundland subservience, uh, yes. you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, yes, I, 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 I get, I get it, I get it. Yeah. And I remember that specifically that Ray uh, column. I was working with Ray, and we were good friends and drank together throughout that whole era of the '70s, yeah. as you know. But anyway, that column, uh, uh, aside from talking about you and, and 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 you guys being the the relatives of, of Johnny Burke, also he responded to some of the criticism that you were getting from some circles that you were doing nothing more, and this is from Newfoundlanders now, mocking 
Newfoundlanders. And Ray addressed that. And I remember reading that column and saying, you're right on, Ray boy. It's like he, we, we all were getting it, or most of us were getting it. And when Ray said it, it almost like validated everything I thought anyway that you were doing, Mary, at the time. It's funny because uh, Henry Sourfoner, who was the guy who directed um, um, uh, This Hour is 22 Minutes and, and really set the tone of This Hour is 22 Minutes, right? He was the early, he was there for, and then he's now with Rick. He's been with Rick for I don't know how many years now. But he had seen Cod, Codco on TV, and he thought that the, the characters were way too large and that it was just a, a complete, um, complete um, fabrication of... And then he came to here to, to meet with us for this hour's 22 minutes. He drove in simply from the airport to the hotel and thought, oh, they're just actually... <laughs> Writing down <laughs> actual, you know, yeah. like I'm in Alan. Alan McGilvery used to work for Michael Donovan. He used to say, "Are there no non-characters in Newfoundland? Is anybody just ordinary? Could there not be an ordinary Newfoundlander? <laughs> like you should just piss him off. He's from Nova Scotia. <laughs> Everybody's ordinary, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be right back with Mary talking about the stresses of producing a weekly live show and the problems it brought for her. Heavy drinking in the early days was all part of the scene, but the drinking turned into a demon as time went on. Mary frankly talks about how it was her work that really helped her shed her drinking problem. Uh, I'm going to uh, switch gears now, Mary, uh, fairly dramatically, and you, you've spoken with great candor about your alcoholism, and for the sake of transparency, which seems to be the buzzword these days, I will acknowledge for our television audience how big or small it is, that uh, as you know, I dealt with a, a, a very bad drinking problem as well. And one of the things that people have asked me over the years is, how did you manage to function, and relatively well, at least until everything came crumbling down relatively well and became a successful journalist while you were still a drunk. So, and I've always uh, wanted to ask you, uh, and now we've got a, <laughs> a new flan audience watching this, but how you manage to function and write and perform uh, when you were in the throes of what you had, you have said very openly was uh, was alcoholism. I could never have done this hour's 22 minutes because, as you know, that was a weekly show, and we had nothing on Monday, and by Friday night we were doing a show in front of a live audience. I'd never have been able to do that, right? Um, the the you know the 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 kindness of strangers as everybody says and not even the kindness of strangers the kindness of the people that you work with uh you know i guess i you know i did i was luckily enough i didn't have the i wouldn't call it binge i had binge drinking i had that kind of drinking where i wouldn't have a drink for a couple of days you know like i'd get really and then i'd be really sick and then i'd be sick for two or three days and swear off and swear i'd never and then day 3 Oh my God, I'm better. I can, this time it's going to be different. So, um, you know, I, th thankfully, you and I were lucky that we didn't go down further. We got, you know, like, because the elevator goes way down, subfloors, right? We only got to the basement and then, uh, you know, like uh, we took the stairs back up. But, um, but, you know, we didn't have to go through everything. But it would have, we, we would have, you know, ended up where everybody else ended up, uh, covered up locked up or what's the other one sobered up yeah Sober. yeah 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 so um that's what i think i just think that uh you know things i had a son which made the difference for me and uh actually it was on those stairs right there but i imagine it on different stairs isn't that funny when i think of the day that i decided that i was just going to have to somebody was going to have to you know change and uh and i, I tell you it wasn't a happy day for me i'll tell you but, uh, but a lot of pain and resentment and rancor. You're always angry with everyone about everything and people are letting you. When I look back at the things that people put up with, uh, you know, I've always been so mad at Codco, you know, and just angry with, well, you, you know, pretty well, but I was for years, but I'm not anymore. But, but, you know, when I really take a look, because really as an, alcoholism is a physical, spiritual and mental illness, but I think it's a really, you know, mental illness for sure, because you're living in a dream world all the time. You know, you're mad at everyone else because they're not treating you right, and you're you're making people. I used to make. Sometimes I used to live over on on um, on La Marchand Road, and people used to come to pick me up in the Codco van. I wouldn't even get out of bed when they blow the horn. I'd, another half hour, I'd snooze in, and then you know. But 
I thought that I didn't think I was taking advantage of. I thought that I was so ill done by that this was just me, you know, getting my just desserts, you know, like mm -hmm. really. When I think of the way that I thought, and I hope that in 30 years, if I get 30 years or 10 years, I don't look back on now and go, oh my God, when I think of the way I thought. That's why in the program, they always suggest that you share your thoughts with someone else, because someone else might go, if I had shared those thoughts with someone else, maybe somebody might have said, you are nuts. I, you you know, know? Yeah, and I think it, it, and it's in retrospect, at least, Mary, that yeah. I feel a, a bit of guilt about how I forced people to be incredibly tolerant of my boozing. You know, yeah. I don't. Do you feel the same way? Absolutely. It's in retrospect, not back then. Oh no! Back then, I was just who I was, and to hell with the rest of them. Yeah, you know? exactly. They're lucky to have me. You know, except <laughs> you know when I wasn't, when I was you know uh, hungover. But uh, yeah, no, I felt resentment against them because who did they think they were, and you know, like thinking they were better than me or. You know, I always thought everybody was better than me, but I had resentment. I used to get overwhelmed with sadness when I used to think, oh, now I gotta wash the dishes. Like I used to think, I mean, really, honestly, I don't mean pretend sadness. I mean deep, abiding sadness and feeling of rancor and resentment that I had to wash the dishes. What was going on? <laughs> like, you know, I mean, yeah. just really ridiculous. Are, are, are you still? Uh Leery about uh, the possibility of, of your picking up a drink and getting Well, last drunk? night I was, my husband teaches uh, a songwriting course, and they went, they had a little concert, not a little concert, I shouldn't have said that, they had a concert at the, uh, at the uh, Bitters, at, uh, you know, uh, at Memorial, and I was bringing beer down to people, and, and I spilled beer on my hand, and I, I almost went like, gave me a real start, because I know that, you know, it would have been, you know, but still, why would I... Why would I even do that? Would I do that if it was Pepsi? Probably, I don't know. But anyway, I got an, I'm very leery of it. Very, very leery of it. And the longer I'm not drinking, the less I want to be caught drinking again. Like the more this life seems so worthwhile and the other life seems such a, I mean, I don't want to dismiss it completely because, you know, I, but when I think about it, I, I, I think I was always unhappy. Even from birth. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary, uh, at the risk of sounding like one of those starstruck journalists I alluded to uh, earlier, you know, I, I've done uh, literally hundreds, hundreds of interviews over the last 45 years. But I have to say, and I'm going to say it, uh, that uh, it's, just, uh, it's just such a, a delightful chore to have to... To be able to interview someone who's not just a friend, but someone for whom I have just immense respect. And perhaps that's something I wouldn't say on air years ago, but I feel very comfortable now to be able to say that. So, yeah. so thanks very much for doing this for us, Oh, Mary. thank you. And I just have to say, I know that health-wise, getting old is difficult. And I know there are things that I can't do, and I get caught up in, you know, things. But it is so much better for me. And maybe that's because, you know, I suffered so long uh, on, you know, with alcohol, right? But for me, you know, even from birth, I was an unhappy child. I felt like I was on the outside. Now that I'm old, er, you know, and sober, I just feel like part of the world. And uh, I just, it's so much better. I think getting old is a, is a great thing. I... I could not believe, I mean, all the things people said to you, I remember people used to say to me, this is the best time of your whole life when I was a teenager. I thought, if this is the best time of my life, I'm just gonna hang myself right now. And indeed it wasn't, you know, and maybe at one time when you were young, it was the best time. But for me, just personally, these have been the best years of my life, but for that's sure. Great. That's yeah. grand to hear, Mary. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Bob. We'd like to thank both Mary and Bob for being part of this series. We'll see you next week. Well, I was a fisherman. I fished all my life. <laughs> up to a 60-year-old. Well, when I retired from fishing, I, I, I got the ground put there, eh, by a truck, made work for myself. I like that, that out around doing things, eh? Get a dose and 
like I say, I don't mean those very much to me dinner and supper. You have to go while you can. I'll go on, onion, uh, beets, carrot, lettuce, and cucumber. We keep them over in the cellar, we call it, root cellar. It's better to have it in a root cellar. It's cool, eh? Down in the ground. Cool. I knew about that all my life. My grandfather had one, my father had one. Well, at first of all, I poured floor in with concrete, eh? Then I got some, bill well, second-hand building blocks, those you do your basement with, or, and I put them around. Then I went and cut some logs and went to a sawmill, got it sawed, and put the house on top. That's about 15 years ago. My father had his down under the house, eh, because he had never had need a basement. My house, our house, was built on a lot of big rocks. That's the only place they'd build back then, because they want, they want their uh, gardens for hay. See, they had a lot of, they had cows, they had sheep, they had horses. So the worst piece of land they had to build a house on it, like rocky land. I think it keeps the, the, the food better. I can remember when they used to go moose on and they back, well, I was only probably four or five year old. They would do wait in the fall around Christmas or before when you get the cold weather. And they'd get their moose and they'd hang their quarter meat out in their shed. And it wouldn't be frozen in the fridge, be naturally froze, better meat. Not even freeze in the roots, all right? That's insulating down the ground, it's warm down in the ground. You can feel the heat when it goes over to take the cover off to go down and get the vegetables. You can feel the heat coming up in your face. Potatoes and the onion. Well, I, I picked the little seeds at Carnes, I picked it because I only got one row there, right? So that's gone before the season is up. Apples, you bag the apples and put them over, and carrots. Only thing down the cellar, the potatoes, if you leave them through the summer, they grow the, what they call the, the root stalks, because it's warm down there, see? It gets warm. So not, well, I don't, it gets warm enough for it to grow, but it's cooler down there than it's up here, but it gets warm enough that uh, they start to grow their, that's their seed, eh? Everybody here back in, before my times, Everybody was a gardener and a fisherman. They used to fish and do gardens. That was what they called the good days. If you have a comment about this program, 